And I thank him that he allows me the opportunity to let it show on the outside. Amen. On this morning, we're going to have you turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be in, begin at verse number 3. I want to thank Minister Smith for that prayer. God bless you. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 3. It says, and this is the NIV, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the richness of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to be put, to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also, who were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation when you believed you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory that ends the reading of Psalms 3, 1 through 14 and I like to focus on verse 13 and verse 14 and it says and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation when you believed you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession in the praise of his glory. And I like to take as a subject on today, who lives in you? A deposit has been made and have you received your deposit? You may have a seat. To live is having life existing in fact or reality, to maintain oneness, to subsist or existence, to obtain eternal life. Though he die, yet shall he live. John eleven twenty five. To live in is being within the confines of a specified place with the power to direct the thinking or behavior of others, usually indirectly. What lives in you has authority, it has clout, it could have credit, influence, and leverage, pull, sway, or weight. Who lives in you or has authority or who has authority or influence in your life. Deposit, to place especially for safekeeping or as a pledge, to put in your trust. 
When a person secures a safety deposit box, it is to keep items of value, money, jewelry, deeds, stocks, bonds, and etc. It puts it, it's put in the trust of the bank to keep it safe and secure. So when the owner returns to reclaim his property, he is assured it will be there. Who lives in you? A deposit has been made. Have you received your deposit? There is something about getting on the inside or being in the inside of someone. Some of you may know and some may not that I am a Star Trek fan. I'm a Trekkie. And if you've ever watched any of the episodes of Star Trek, whenever an alien being wants to take over the Enterprise, it will first have to get into the Enterprise. Yeah. The Enterprise would usually be aware there's an entity trying to infiltrate their ship, but they have to breach the hull of the ship first. Once the hull is breached, the alien be beam would have to figure out how he can take control of the Enterprise. So they would start by entering into one of the crew members, mind or body. Most of the time, it wouldn't be any, in, in just anybody. It would either be, it would be one of the officers. Why an officer? Because the alien knew that if he could get control of the officer, the likelihood of gaining control of the ship was greater. Control the officer who has influence over the crew and gain control of the ship. But there was always somebody who would figure it out and devise a way to exercise the alien being. But once inside, the alien would wreak havoc on the ship. There's something important about getting on the inside. You see, as children of God, the enemy is always trying to infiltrate our lives to take over and turn us away, or around or away from God. He starts on the outside, the whole, attaching to our worldly goods and possessions, and we feel the attack. We are warned of the intended breach. So the whole is breached. Are we in jeopardy? of being infiltrated. Can you hold the enemy off? Can you keep him from getting the one thing that you have been entrusted by God? Who you wonder why is the enemy attacking me? Because he wants what's in your safety deposit box. When a gang wants to influence someone to join them, they do things for you to influence you to see what you are offering. May I? Yeah. Yeah. May I have something to drink, please? To see what they are offering you is what you are missing and it's really what you need. They buy things, clothes, shoes. They protect you, feed you, look out for you, whatever you want, nice jewelry, the latest video system. They give you the attention they know you are looking for and convince you that they love you better than your family. They can provide for you better than your own family. They get inside your head and began to see it, it you began to see it their way and you get caught up and then sucked in you began to believe this is where I want and need to be because they care for me only they have brainwashed you they have infiltrated your mind and heart and now have control of you. Why? Because you have filled that void in your heart with temporal things. It's a void only meant for God. Your deposit was waiting, but you couldn't see it. Who lives in you? One more example, and I will move on. I don't know if any of you have seen, seen the movie Tyler Perry produced, Temptation. This young country girl was raised in the church, but the church was not in her. She had a little friend who was a boy, and he was her best friend. They grew up together. They played together. They went to college together. 
They got their degrees together. They got married and moved to the city together. He was a pharmacist and she was a relationship psychologist. She helped people figure out why their relationships didn't work and how they could improve. She was good at her job. She was one of the top relationship counselors. If there was a tough client, they would send them to her. One day, she got a client that was skilled and cunning and knew how to manipulate and appeal to women. It was in such a way that they could not see who or what he was all about or what kind of person he really was. He was a rich man. He had lots of money, fine house, a nice car, and he even had his own plane. He could woo you, wine and dine you. He could fly you to the moon and back. He could appeal to whatever your life dreams were. Did I mention he was a cunning man? He was able to look at this counselor, the way she dressed and the way she responded or didn't respond to his questions. He would make suggestions about what was lacking in her marriage and manipulated his way into her head and caused her to feel like she was missing out on some things because she only knew one man and he was just a typical man, repetitious and no excitement kind of guy. The man reversed the roles on her. He became the psychologist and was able to get inside her head and cause her to second guess herself and to have desires that she had not experienced before. He caused her to reject her husband and turn on her mother. He turned her world upside down. He was a hateful man, an abusive man, a controlling man, a drug user and HIV positive. She experienced it all, all because she had not taken claim of her deposit. Of these three examples, none of them had in them what it takes to counteract the enemy's attack. They were candidates for infiltration from the enemy. Who lives in you? A deposit has been made. Have you received your deposit? Here in our text, we have Paul preparing to sail across the Asian Sea to reach Jerusalem by Pentecost. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul was the Ephesians father in the faith. The one who explained salvation by grace through faith in them. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Acts 19, 1 through 7. In order to make it to Jerusalem on time, Paul did not have time to meet with all the Ephesians, so he called on the elders to join him for a brief meeting before the departure to Jerusalem. Paul feared that he would never see them again, and he wanted to leave the elders with a charge for the church. Something any loving father would do for his family, his children, when he was leaving and possibly never coming back. He charged the Ephesian elders to remain alert and be watchful shepherds, defending the flock and building up the body of Christ in their city. When Paul reached Jerusalem, he would be attacked and then put under house arrest in Rome for two years. On this tearful day, having commended the elders to God and to the word of his grace, Acts 20.32, the apostle of grace sailed into a future, certain of only one thing. Grace is with all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. In verse 3, it says, Praise be to God our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. The three words that stand out in this verse are praise, blessed, and blessing. First of all, we should praise God 
God for what he has done for us. Yeah. It is through our experiences of forgiveness, salvation, and healing that we can come to praise him. It would be impossible for us to worship God in reality if we had not felt in our own lives the impact of his being. It is the relationship between him and us that makes praise well up out of our hearts. An unconverted person has no idea who God is and sees no reason to praise. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. John 3, 3. The intent is that we bless God because he has blessed us. It is the relationship between him and us that make praise well up in our hearts. The question then is how can a man bless God with our worship? If we as his creation can bless our creator, that concludes at least some equality with him. And that turns out to be the purpose of God's grace, to fill us with his glory, with his holiness, and with himself. Obviously, we have nothing in ourselves with which to bless God. The only blessing we have is the one we have received from him. Yeah. Nothing is given directly to us. Everything comes to us through Jesus Christ. This recognition of vital importance, it sets Christianity apart from Judaism and from all other religions in the world. Outside of Christ, there are no blessings for man. In him, all spiritual blessings in the heavenly are ours. So what is meant by heavenlies? Heavenlies refer to heaven, to man's relation to spiritual truths, and to the divine and eternal realm. Jesus compared the earthly things concerning rebirth of men on earth with the heavenly things concerning the revelation of his divine person from heaven. John 3.12 if I had told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe? If I tell you heavenly things, well, heavenly should be associated directly with heaven itself and the presence of God. Hebrew 9.24 says, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for God. God appeared to for us in God's presence. Just as a photograph can picture a person of flesh and blood and even describe the mood the person is in, it is not the person himself. Similarly, earthly riches and values can only point in the direction. Real blessings is not physical well-being or material wealth or even emotional happiness. These are temporal blessings given to us for earthly matters. It is a spiritual unseen entity, much more real than we can comprehend. It is too big for us to see or handle in our present state, yet it has a full and decisive impact upon everything thing we accomplish in this world. A person in Christ has the real thing whether he is a rich man or poor. That is why slaves can be freer than masters and prisoners than jailers. Poor people can be richer than millionaires in Christ. When Pastor Brown went to Africa he shared with us how those people don't have much. Talking about material things. But they were rich in worshiping God God for what they did have. Who lives in you? A deposit has been made. Have you received your deposit? Those in Christ have every spiritual blessing needed for spirit, soul, and body, for the past, present, and future, for salvation and service, for time and eternity, both now and forever. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 9, it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. In our words, our earthly bodies are 
like fragile clay jars to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despaired, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Second Corinthians 4, 18 says, so we don't look at the troubles that we can't see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. The spiritual blessings we, we as believers have in Christ encompass every need and aspect of our lives. Paul specified that these blessings are in the heavenly realms. So that readers will understand this promise is not one of earthly blessings that will pass away, but of spiritual blessings that will endure forever. It's for really guaranteed. In verse 4 through 14. Excuse me. Paul defines the content of spiritual blessings. There appear to be five. Verse 4 says God chose us. Verse 5 says he predestined us. Verse 7 says he redeemed us. Verse 9 says he revealed his mysteries to us. And verse 13, he marked us with the seal of the Holy Spirit. God is love, and love does not wish to be alone by definition. Love Love requires relationships. So God chose for himself a people to be his own special possession. First Peter 2, 9 through 10, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, for he chose and chose us to select freely us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. But the point of importance is that Paul doesn't say he chose us before the creation of the world, but he chose us in him. The object of God's choice is Christ, not individuals outside of him. Whoever is in Christ is chosen. Therefore, this leaves the choice to be in Christ or not to be in Christ. The account of Noah in the Old Testament proclaims an illustration of man's opportunity to choose. Peter tells us he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly. This would imply that while building the ark, Noah announced judgment to come and thus invited his generation to flee it by entering the ark. The ark must have been open to everyone who wanted to enter. Noah surely called for confession of sin and repentance, and salvation was there. In the same way, way God chose the ark as a place of salvation and did not restrict it to Noah and his family. So he chose Christ who invites all who are weary and burdened to come to him. And the goal is to be holy and blameless in his sight. If we have turned our lives over to Jesus Christ and we are in him, there's no reason to ever doubt what God intends to do with our lives. Long before our physical existence, God had his plan for each of us. Verse 5, in love, he predestined us. He determined our fate in advance. He adopted us as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Here, the outlines of sin and salvation are clearly drawn. The coming of Jesus into the world and his obedience and death on the cross put an end to the era of sin. 
the question was settled. As Hebrew says, after he had provided purification for sin, he sat at the right hand of the, of the majesty in heaven. So through the forgiveness of our sins and the cleansing thereof, God made us through adoption, heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Adoption in Paul's time was a common concept in Roman world. Well, a man could adopt a boy to whom he was physically unrelated to become a member of his family as if he had begotten the child himself. Yeah. In our present day adoption is very common. However, we cannot create a bloodline where it doesn't really exist. <laughs> God solved this problem through the blood of Christ and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We do become part of his being. The secret of our mystery is his love. In love he predestined us. It is legal, it is real, and it is true. Yeah. If anything should draw our eyes away from the problems we have with the manifestation of our present sinful nature and the world we live in, it is this, the execution of God's eternal plan within us to make us what he is. The fact that this surpasses our earthly experience does not change the fact. Verse 6 explains to the praise of our glorious grace, which he has freely given in the one he loves. God loves the world, says John 3.16. But the experience of God's love is only felt if we accept Jesus as our Savior. Verse 7 continues, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the richness of God's grace. This is the third facet of all spiritual blessings. The reference is obviously to the death on the cross of our Lord. No love for Jesus is possible without the acceptance of his death on our behalf. Well, acceptance of death of Christ in our stead means much more than covering up sin. It means redemption, release from debt, from sin, its power and its consequences. Redemption means salvation, freedom from imprisonment. Paul says, for he has rescued us from dominion of darkness and brought us into the excuse me, kingdom of the son he loves. The blood of Christ saves us from the power of the evil one. It also gives us forgiveness of sin. The blood of Christ wipes our slate clean. The fact that Christ took upon himself our sin means that his righteousness is put upon us. This Paul states so beautifully in 2 Corinthians, God has made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, who lives in you. Verse 9 starts introducing us to the mysteries which, to with which the rest of this epist epistle filled. And he made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. The significance of this is not only that the second person of the Trinity is put into a certain supreme office, but that the headship of all is bestowed upon a man, Jesus, and that we are included in this mandate. Christ is seated upon the throne of the universe, and we are placed with him. This is basically what the rest of this paragraph says. Paul does not speak these verses particularly about victory over evil, but he speaks about things that will be put in effect when the time will be reached will reach their fulfillment. The struggle against the devil will not be an everlasting one. It is hard to imagine what our active role will be. Jesus describes our part in heaven as being responsible for true riches. 
So if we have not been trustworthy in handling worldly riches, who will trust you with true riches? Luke 16 and 11. As man, we play a part in, our, in the demonstration of God's humility. But then comes that which exceeds our wildest imagination. The fact that God will demonstrate his glory through us and in us. Twice Paul states that we who are put, we who put our hope in Christ will be to the praise of his glory. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. And now we come to our key verse, verse 13. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Notice, it says, we were also included in Christ when we heard the message of truth. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It lets us know that there are some steps we have to take in order to know about this deposit, but hearing only includes us. But notice it says, when you believed, well, Romans 10, 9 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. When you believed, then you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We can't just read the word, but we must believe what it says. When something is marked with a seal, it is stamped with the owner's, owner's name and secured as being his or her possession. God marks believers as his very own by sending his Holy Spirit to live with us. The Holy Spirit himself is the seal. God puts his seal, the Holy Spirit, the proof of his own ownership upon our lives as a guarantee. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Moses asked to see God's glory. The only thing he received was a partial rear view, but it was enough to shine through him so that Israel could not stand the sight of him. What will it be when we, be, when we are able to praise his glory? Tamala Mann sings a song. I can only imagine what it would be like. When I walk by your side, I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. <clears throat> I can only imagine, I can only imagine to be surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. And she says, yeah, I can only imagine. Imagine who is deposit a who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to praise of his glory. The link between the day of glory to come and our present life on earth is the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul says that the Holy Spirit seals us for the inheritance. He is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Paul says that God set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Well, Who lives in you? A deposit has been made. Well, have you received your deposit? Mm -hmm. Nowhere does Paul refer to our exalted position in Christ in, as something that draws the glory to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We will be glorious, but it is the glory of God. Well, we are what we are to praise to the praise of his glory. The irony is that Satan wanted to make himself like the Most High, and he failed because he sought his own glory. We will receive what he failed to grasp because we will be his glory. All honor and glory we will receive will be for Christ's sake. Who lives in you? A deposit has been made. Have 
after you receive your deposit. What is a deposit? Ephesians 1.13b says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is deposit is guaranteeing our inheritance until redemption of those who are his possession. He should be the one who lives in you. Corinthians 3, 1b through 17 says, set your heart on things above. Well where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And if he lives in you, you should set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden in Christ and God. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil decisions, desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things, such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed and knowledge in the image of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to be to peace. And be thankful. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Have you received your deposit? If you have not received your deposit, let me tell you how you can receive it. Romans 10, 9, 9 through 10 says, First you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. For with your heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. A deposit has been made ready for you. It's guaranteed. No overdrafts. No penalty for early withdrawals. No threat of the market crashing. You'll always have something in the bank because it matures and it will mature. It won't mature until Christ comes. It will be paid in full. Who lives in you? I hope you said the Holy Spirit lives in you. I hope he has been deposited in your heart because if you haven't allowed him in, then 2 Peter 3, 10 through 11 says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heaven will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done and it will be laid bare. Well, Since everything will be destroyed in that way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, you ought to live holy and godly lives. Yes. Capital One asks the question, what's in your wallet? I don't know what's in your wallet, but I know who's waiting with a deposit for your heart. Well, Pastor Brown preached the other Sunday. I got something in the bank. What's in your account? Who's sitting in the captain's seat? Red alert, red alert. The USS Enterprise has been put out of commission. There's a new vessel in town. Let me take you on a journey. The FSH, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost vessel is waiting. Heaven, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the heaven-bound soldiers of Jesus Christ. It's continuing mission to spread the gospel of 
Jesus Christ to all mankind to go out into the highways and byways, compelling men, women, boys, and girls to come to Jesus, to seek out new life in Christ, to be marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is deposited, guaranteeing our inheritance, and to live with Jesus in the new Jerusalem, to boldly go where no man has gone before, especially if you don't know Jesus. Red alert, the enemy is approaching. Shields up, arm your weapons, make sure you have the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is our guarantee, we will win. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the devil in the time of evil. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and God's body armor of righteousness. Stand your ground with your feet with fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Stand your ground with a shield of faith which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Stand your ground with a helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and in every occasion. Stay alert and persistent in your prayer for all believers everywhere who lives in you. I hope you said there's love. It's in the deposit. Who lives in you? I hope you said joy. It's in the deposit. I hope you said peace. It's in the deposit. I hope you said long suffering. It's in the deposit. I hope you said gentleness. It's in the deposit. I hope you said goodness. It's in the deposit. I hope you said faith because it's in the deposit. I hope you said meekness because it's in the deposit. I hope you said temperance because it's in the deposit. The captain is waiting and ready to make your deposit and seal you with his Holy Spirit and arm you for the Holy Ghost battle. Who is the captain? He's my captain and his name is Jesus, the precious son of God. He is my king of kings and he's my lord of lords. He's my savior and my redeemer. He's Emmanuel. God is with us. He's El Shaddai, the almighty. He is El Shalom, the God of peace. He is my refuge. He covers me. He is my mother. He is my joy in sorrow. He's my hope for tomorrow. He's my all in all. Do you know him? Do you know him? He's my strength when I'm weak. He's my comforter when I'm sad. He's my Lord. Do you know him? Do you know him? What is he to you? Who lives in you? A deposit has been made in my life. He can be all those things to you and more. If you know him, have you received your deposit? God bless you.